All right, everybody, welcome to the February 23rd, 2021 uh, Community Resources Committee meeting. Uh, I, just to get things started here, everybody uh, should be aware that this uh, meeting is both being both audio and video recorded. Um, so um, careful what you say. Um, and um, Laura, could you do the roll call? Sure. Councillor Foster. Sorry, here. <laughs> Councillor Jarrett. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. And Councillor Thorpe. Here. All right, we, we're all here and we have a quorum. Um, at this point, we open the floor up to public comment. I see a hand raised. <laughs> And also, uh, before we do public comment, I, I just want to say, if you want to speak to something that's later on the agenda, uh, we ask that you save your comments for that, but you're, you're free to speak to us about any mat matter. And also that uh, we ask that uh, you, when you speak, you not defame anybody. You're, you're welcome to say whatever you want about the counselors in the frames here, but not any of our other guests or any other people mm -hmm. out in, in the public. And um, that, um, so that's kind of, but otherwise you can say what you want. I see Jackie Balance has her hands raised, her hand raised. Uh, Laura, can you let Jackie in the, un unmute her so she can speak. She's unmuted. Yes, I, I was I was unmuted and I'd like, I'll take my hand down later. You all know me already. I'm Jackie Balance. I live in Florence uh, and I'm on a bit of a crusade because we're having a um, zoning emergency here. Um, hardly know where to start. It's, it's so complicated. But y'all y'all just last city council meeting passed on the second reading the climate resilience and regeneration plan, which is supposed to inform our discussions and our policy decisions going forward. I have actually read it a, a couple times because uh, it's very dense and comprehensive. And I gleaned out a few pieces that are relevant to housing. And I'm real excited to see that we're talking about housing later tonight. The two ordinances that are coming up both look interesting. Um, but back to the r, &R plan. You, you probably read this in my guest column in the Gazette last weekend. The carbon footprint of our buildings constitutes 70% of our carbon. And of that 70%, that's buildings all together, 18% comes from single family homes, not apartments, not multifamily units, but 18% from single family homes. Within the city's footprint, it says that increasing building efficiency is the most cost-effective way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And this requires a variety of actions, including right-sizing new construction to avoid overbuilding. We are having overbuilding on both ends of my block. It goes on to say aggressive net zero requirements can go a long way towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions in our new and existing building sector. Buildings with what they call greater passive survivability will help keep occupants safe. That refers to the ability of a building to maintain critical conditions, even during extended loss of power, heating fuel or water. Think Texas, where they finally are learning maybe that the envelope of your house matters much more than quartz countertops. The plan goes on to say we need to apply a resilience and regeneration point system in the site plan approvals. That's on page 38 if you want to go to read the plan. We need to encourage housing diversity, smaller residential units that are efficient with resources. That includes the resources that build them as well as the resources they consume ongoing. Equity, of course, cuts across all aspects of this plan. These are the principles that the City Council passed last week. The de development on my street violates every single principle. I got a personal email from Wayne Fiden yesterday morning 
um, explaining to me that the resilience and regeneration point system in site plan approvals has not even been drafted yet, but his Department of Energy and Sustainability will be drafting that point system site plan. And then of course it goes through a couple of public hearings and then it goes to committees and it's gonna be a while before it's on board. I'm asking, I am begging for a moratorium on building permits to developers, at least until we get the, um, I, I, it's too many words. I got to get regeneration, resilience and regeneration point system site plan approvals criteria in place. These houses cost $600,000. Nobody who grew up on the street can afford one. The people who are buying these houses are You're people who can afford, then <laughs> sorry, I'm, 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 are, are people who can afford more house than, they, than anybody here needs they are people who don't care that they're going to be living with fossil fuel heat and on the, on the edge of climate catastrophe. And he's, he's just going to, our community would rather host Syrian refugees, and we were going to do that just before Trump was elected, than to host these dinosaur McMansions. He's got three, he's buying up corner lots as fast as the widows die. And he's got plans in the works to build at least a dozen more of these houses within the next few months. I beg you for a moratorium. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jackie. Is there anybody else who would like to speak for public comment? Um, I don't see any other virtual hands raised. And I see there's a Martha, a Nick, and a Marty's phone. Um, no hands raised there. Okay. Um, so, uh, next up on the agenda, do we have any updates and announcements from the committee members? Councillor Jarrett. Uh, this might be covered later, uh, but I just thought I'd, I'd mentioned that the public hearings on the two items that we're going to talk about, um, later will that will be on Monday, March 8th at 7 p.m., the Joint Legislative Matters and Planning Board meeting. Uh, so uh, that, that will be the next time that this is these two are taken up. Thank you, Councillor Jarrett. Very useful information. Uh, anything else that people want to announce? Okay, uh, next up on the agenda, minutes of the previous meeting. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes from November 16th, 2020? Motion to, to approve. Okay, I think I, it was Councillor Foster and then seconded by Councillor Thorpe, is that right? That's fine. Okay, um, any discussion on the minutes? No discussion. Okay, uh, Laura, could we get a roll call? Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Abstain. Councillor Nash. Uh, yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, cool. All right, we are rolling around long here. Item number six, which has two parts to it, A and B. So uh, part number, you know what? Uh, so there are two parts here. Um, these are, uh, item A is um, an ordinance relative to affordable housing, referred to community resources, legislative matters and the planning board on 1-7-2021, and an ordinance to create an income, uh, to create an incentive for smaller houses by allowing two half scale units to count as a single family for density purposes, ref referred to community resources, legislative matters and planning board on 2-4-2021. And so I think the best way to get this started is to not have me read these into the record, but um, we have Carolyn Mish with us here today. And Laura, if we could share our screen with, with, with uh, Carolyn and she's got a, a PowerPoint to help explain these ordinances. Yep. 
Are you ready uh, to go, Carolyn? I am. Okay, you have the floor. Take it away. Uh, okay. Um, so the two ordinances I've combined to talk about um, together because um, they're part of a system or a package of um, four um, pieces um, of legislation that um, is moving forward that relates to housing and trying to encourage and create incentives for housing development at different levels. Um, so the two, as you mentioned, um, Councilor Nash are affordable housing incentives and also incentives for development of smaller units. Um, and I just want to take a, a step back um, just to show how the planning processes relate to zoning and how we get to the zoning changes. Um, and we've been incrementally um, modifying the zoning um, for um, 20 years now, um, but starting in um, sort of some of the history, I won't go back to before 2010, but in 2010 was our first sort of updated uh, plan for the city, Sustainable Northampton. Um, and following on the heels of that, we had a zoning review committee that developed um, ordinances to help implement some of those key initial um, features or policy recommendations out of planning because zoning, is a tool to use to implement the policies that are adopted in the plan, just like with the recently adopted sort of update to the Sustainable Northampton Plan and the Climate Resilience and Regeneration Plan sets out goals and objectives, but many of those can only be implemented through actions taken by the city, some of which will be regulatory and, and also relate to zoning. Um, 2011, we had a housing needs assessment um, and another follow-up to that was a report on the barriers to fair housing that was done with um, in consultation with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And then of course, just now, um, the council and the planning board have adopted the Climate Resilience and Regeneration Plan. On the zoning side of the equation, we've been doing incremental updates to the zoning to try to keep track with uh, those um, implementation steps identified in those plans. Um, and we'll be continuing to do that um, going forward. But the amendments that we're gonna be talking about tonight are a piece of that and how, we, how it relates to that plan and what goals and objectives we're trying to achieve through that. So currently in one phase or another, there are about four of these um, ordinances um, or, or groupings of ordinances that are moving forward in the process. And we're looking at them as a whole package of, uh, uh, and a strategy to try to create more attainable housing for people. So in some cases that's um, making it uh, um, more accessible for people who um, have, uh, you know, are working in the service se sector, work for public agencies, the schools, um, the city, um, downtown. Um, in other cases, it's, it's about um, encouraging subsidized affordable housing um, because we need to meet the needs of people, you know, who might not even be able to achieve housing that's, you know, at the market rate, but might need a little bit more of a boost. So we're working on this house, affordable housing amendment that's in front of you, the incentives for smaller units. And then the two family by right has already moved through the public hearing process. Um, and that's um, a, that was a piece of zoning that's really trying to get at um, um, smaller and more, um, dispersed housing throughout the city into the, the suburban residential and rural residential districts of the city where um, multi-family is not allowed. And in fact, it's been singularly single family homes that have been allowed there. And that, that's sort of a legacy of, of um, zoning where single family homes sort of run supreme and they're untouchable and their areas created initially to sort of segregate populations. So the people who have large lots and big houses can live off in one area and then 
the rest of the cities for everyone else. So we're trying to address that. And then the fourth one it hasn't come forward yet, but we've talked about it a lot is, um, and it's moving through the process is to expand multifamily housing allowability within downtown Florence and downtown Northampton. Um, and sort of, this is more of a matrix to look at those four items and sort of why we're moving forward on those and what, how will it fit together and meet the goals of our um, climate resilience and regeneration plan. Um, and we're gonna be focusing on this highlighted area in yellow here, but um, I just wanna run through some of these numbers because um, it's important to know sort of why we're, targeting these ordinances. And so the two family, which you've already heard about, it's gonna come back to council March 4th for a vote, um, was put forward to address um, equity by providing rentals in every single neighborhood in the city um, to create opportunities to lower that, the median price for individual um, units, also to reduce carbon footprints. The more number of units under one roof, the less, um, um, energy is required to um, be provided for those units. The, the, the way this, is, this fits together is it creates more housing options. Um, two family units are smaller in size and less costly. We've done an analysis of uh, single family homes in Northampton and the median single family home is right around 1800 square feet, um, just under 1800 square feet. The median um, unit size for two families are around 1,200 square feet. Um, and you can see the values here as well that we've run the figures that two family units are um, per unit. Uh, the median is 114,000 versus 330,000. Um, also um, important to know is, is by allowing additional units on, on a parcel, uh, that means we're um, um, using less impervious surface per person. Um, moving forward and looking at the two ordinances in front of you tonight, um, the bonus density for deed restricted affordable units is being moved forward to address equity in the affordable housing development sort of realm. Um, we're attempting to lower the cost and the burden to those housing aff affordable housing developers and nonprofits like um, Valley CDC. Um, and we're doing that and I'll run through the specifics um, to um, reduce the upfront requirements that are typically required for um, um, building a project under the state's 40B um, regulations. The bonus density for half scale homes in the URB and URC is um, to address, again, to address equity and providing more attainable housing, lower the median price, um, create housing that's next to the urban core, which will support local businesses and reduce parking and driving demand. And again, reduce um, carbon footprint um, and also um, that relates to providing housing options at, you know, that are at um, lower than the median house size and, and price point, uh, frankly. So um, to get into sort of the details of that, um, under the affordable housing incentive, uh, the, the way the language proposes that planning board reviews through site plan um, up to, um, a density bonus of up to 250% of what the underlying zoning would normally allow uh, and up to a 60% reduction in the frontage depth and width of a parcel that would be normally be required in that district. But the, the flip side of that is that 50% of the units must be deed restricted for 30 years or 99 years, depending on whether they're homeownership units or rental units. 30 years would be on the homeownership end, 99 years would be for the, on the rental side. Um, the units have to be placed on the Department of Housing and Community Development subsidized housing inventory because that's the, 
that's the sort of check at the state level to see how um, Northampton stacks up with the rest of the, of the Commonwealth. And also there's sort of a 10, there is a 10% threshold um, below which we don't want to fall as a community because um, it's the minimum standard for in terms of good policy and providing housing for um, people, um, needs of all the people in the community, but also um, uh, Ten percent is sort of the magic number the state has determined um, that below which um, a community would be subject to what's referred to as a 40B project, wherein um, a housing developer could come in and ask for all sorts of waivers of every kind of regulation within the city, um, and the um, if the city doesn't grant that permit, then it gets appealed up to the state and then the state housing um, board makes a determination about whether that project should be approved. So it takes the control out of the local government, uh, essentially, once you drop below that 10% threshold. Um, so the other um, important components of the affordable housing incentive language are that um, there'll be a permanent energy source um, shall be from the grid or on site supplied electric. So no fossil fuels to, uh, to generate, um, you know, heating or hot water um, or other thermal loads. And then the other piece of this is to um, sort of write in a potential waiver for significant tree replacement, um, wherein if significant trees are removed um, from the site as part of the project, the applicant would be required to replace to the extent feasible on site, but if they couldn't quite replace all of those trees on site, that would be the end of their obligation. They wouldn't have to pay into the tree replacement fund after that. And the idea, of course, is not to create another burden for um, targeted affordable housing projects, which are ready or marginal and are really um, built in order to support the people who um, are having the most difficult time um, attaining housing in our community. Um, so that's that piece. The other, some details for the half scale units for, or the incentive for um, building small units um, are, um, this is, would only be applicable in the urban residential being urban residential C districts. We're going to define a half scale unit as 800 square feet or less. And essentially, two units count for one. So, if in terms of density, if in, on one parcel you could do one single family home, you could, in the alternative, do two half scale units. Um, and if you recall from the medians, the median house, single family house in Northampton is 1,700 upwards, almost 1,800 square feet. So what we're saying is if you're doing two 800 square feet units um, in total, that's 1,600 square feet, that's still below that median um, house size in Northampton. Um, and this would be allowed in um, all three categories of by right, site plan and special permit. Um, and again, um, the, uh, we're, we're adding language about these units needing to um, be run um, and function on um, systems that do not rely on fossil fuel uh, for heat, water, um, electricity. Um, so again, grid sourced um, heat for, for that. Um, and, um, you know, these, this half scale units could, the idea is if they could be individual units on a parcel. So, um, detached single units on a parcel. Um, these are some examples of, um, small homes that already exist in Northampton that are, um, right around the 800 square foot or even smaller size or half scale units could be in the context of a multifamily house. So, a, the picture on the lower right is um, a four unit um, property in Northampton. So potentially, um, per, you know, pretend, uh, let's say you didn't, normally you'd only be able to fit a single family or two family on that property. Um, you could double that and have a four unit on the property for the same lot size as um, a two family. 
Um, so that, um, and then I just want to show you on the map again to familiarize your, um, you all with where these zoning um, ordinances would take effect. So for the affordable housing piece, that would be applicable throughout the city. So no matter what zoning district, if an affordable housing developer were coming forward um, for a project, they uh, that um, could be done in, in a bonus density um, and relief from going to state first to get site eligibility would be applicable anywhere in the city. For the half scale units, it's URB and URC is what's being proposed. So the URB is sort of this orange area here. And then um, the dark, darker orange is urban residential C that surrounds downtown Northampton. So it's basically from urban residential C that it's immediately surrounding downtown and then out towards Florence Center, this um, or slightly lighter orange is the urban residential B. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, here's how I'd like to do things here. I'd like, um, for, I, I, we have members of the public here. Um, we, uh, I'm going to invite those folks to, um, to ask some questions a little bit later in the meeting. Um, I'm going to open it up to counselors first, and um, and that includes Councillor Mayori, who is in the meeting, uh, if she wishes to ask a question. Um, I also want to frame things in terms of uh, uh, Carolyn, uh, Ms. Miss, Mish, that's hard to say. Ms. You could just say Carolyn. Carolyn. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that she has mentioned the, the two-family ordinance that's already been through the hearing process and on its way to council. We can't discuss it here. I tried to verify whether or not we could weasel in some questions here and there, because I think a few of us wanted to talk about that. We can't do that. We need to speak to the two things on the agenda. If Carolyn wants to respond with, with two families as part of her answer, she's free to do that. And the members of the public can do that as well. Um, and the last thing is, before we get to discussion, um, we have two guests here who are um, familiar with these processes. Uh, we have Laura Baker, and um, Laura, do you want to pop in here for a, for a moment? And what, I, what would be cool is if Laura and Carolyn could have a little discussion real quick <laughs> about how this is helpful for them. Because Laura, you're the person with Valley CDC who actually goes through all of the, the paperwork. Yes, just, that's it right there. And, <laughs> uh, um, and how this is helpful for your organization. I mean, it- Obviously we favor any zoning changes that make it uh, easier to create affordable housing. Hi, Carolyn, how you doing? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so I did um, read through these two uh, provisions um, and I, I, again, am wholly supportive. Um, I did have a few comments, if it's appropriate to make them. Um, That's in terms great, of go for it. Language. So it is true that when we go through a basically two-step process to get a site eligibility letter from the state and then come to the, the city or town, it is onerous and it is long. I've had them take six to nine months at the state level, which is kind of crazy. Um, so if there's a way to short circuit that, it saves a developer time and money for sure. Um, one thing, Carolyn, I noticed about how this was written was the requirement to do a LIP application. So I would suggest that might want to be broader um, so that if you're um, producing units that can be listed on the subsidized housing inventory, you could also be um, seeking subsidized state housing funding sources as another way to, as an entry point to the subsidized housing inventory. It doesn't have to be the LIP program per se. Okay. Um, and then I would say about the, the fossil fuels, um, we are moving in that direction. Um, there is a lot of pressure on budgets in the development of affordable housing. And so it makes me a little wary. <laughs> um, and so I don't disagree with the intention of it at all. Um, there are cases where it might be hard to achieve. And so I would encourage the city to think about whether that's the only standard that you're willing to apply. So whether 
passive house or net zero or some other standards might also be acceptable in addition to the no fossil fuel standard. It's totally for you guys to think about. The more flexibility we can get, the more creative we can be in how we use particular um, parcels. So those were the, the thoughts that I had about the, the density bonus. Um, certainly would be welcome news to us when we go to develop, density is the issue. I mean, it's really the number one issues that we need to build at a denser scale than is typically allowed under zoning. Um, it's almost always true. So I think, um, I mean, just the note about whether it's the lit process or seeking state funding yep. um, is totally fine. The, the idea is we just want to make sure that we're counted. Sure. So if um, there are more, if there's more than one way to do that, then absolutely, that's fine. That's really, yeah. really only the reason for that language. Yeah. The lip process yeah. by itself can be awfully onerous. So you don't want to do yeah. it if you don't have to. If you're already yeah. going in for other funding sources that will trigger the same things, you wouldn't also want to do lip. It lip comes right. in really if you're not getting any other um, sources. Yeah. Public sources. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. So to this particular zoning uh, proposal. Counselors, do you have any questions? <laughs> Counselor Jared. Uh, hello, thanks Carolyn for the presentation. Um, I have, um, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of the, re the requirements in section B that talk about, you know, up to 250% density, 40% minimum frontage lot depth and lot width. Um, ha do those ha have to apply or rather that's the maximum um, density bonus that would be granted? It was sort of unclear to me. Yeah, so that's intended to be the maximum. And um, I, you know, for the, the 40% um, or the 60% of loud reduction um, comes from another um, provision that's in the zoning already for um, open space dedication. So we have a provision that says if someone is going to be dedicating open space and it requires a sliver of frontage, for example, to get to that open space and that frontage reduces the lot size, the, the minimum um, reduces the frontage down below the minimum, that would be acceptable because we don't want to penalize someone who's offering to give open space to the city. Um, and you can do that down to um, as so long as you maintain at least 40% of that dimension. So we use that as sort of the foundation to say I'm up to a maximum of 60% um, of the frontage and depth and width could be um, waived, um, but you need to keep a, a minimum of 40%. So it doesn't mean you would, you know, you might not need to use all of that, but that would be the, sort of the allowable window. Mm -hmm. And so the open space requirements don't change. The open space requirements don't change, except that in that, final provision under C, a special permit, that other dimensional requirements could be waived, but it's a higher threshold. So right, okay. potentially open space could be waived, um, but it would be, it wouldn't be site plan, it would be special permit. Right. Okay. And then so uh, looking at, you know, thinking about just trying to get a sense of what 250% density means. So Right now in, in urban residential B, it's 17.4 units per acre. That was my calculation based on the 2,500 square feet. Um, it, you know, uh, <clears throat> is the minimum lot. Um, and so then this would bring it to potentially like 43 units per acre. Um, <clears throat> that's just trying to understand. So, you know, I'm thinking about like my house, it sits on 0.38 acres, it has 100 feet of frontage. Right now, three units are allowed by right and six with site plan approval. So does that mean I could have 15 units by site plan approval under this ordinance? Assuming the, you know, I had the open space or whatever, um, that it looks like the lot size, you know, would allow for 16. 
So I'm just trying to get a sense of, you know, what are some cases that we're seeing mm -hmm. with, with, what are some potential cases where we would, would see this in, in urban, you know, in, um, yeah, in, in, yeah. Yeah, if you could just discern. So um, the answer, the, the sort of short answer without looking at the details of the property is sure, potentially 15 units on your property so long as eight of them were permanently deed restricted as affordable housing. Um, but you also have to be able to fit the other aspects of a project on the property. So well, let's take an example. Um, in the urban core, a Valley CDC just did 82 Bridge Street. They came through under a different zoning provision called 40R, which allows way more density. You know, like, I mean, in that case, I guess it would be, I can't remember, it was 25 or 35 units per acre, but they went from what we would refer to as 15 units in that house up to 32, right, Laura? 31. 31. So they doubled the number of units, technically the way that we count units on that property um, under, and so it would be a similar um, example of, you know, they would be obviously much smaller units um, and in a, a structure that was compressed. It wouldn't be like a single family house. You wouldn't be just adding units on. It really depends on how you design it. I think really where the 250% comes into play more likely would be in the outlying area, in this more suburban locations where you only have four units per acre allowed. Um, so, the, and, and we're working on a project um, that you all are aware of uh, on Woodlawn um, where it's one unit per um, uh, 40,000 square feet. So it's even just about um, one unit just under an acre, per acre. So in that case, you're talking about two more houses on an acre. Um, and I think that's where someone might take advantage of that 250% as opposed to in an in-town location. Um, and frankly that's sort of the that was sort of the test case that we used for the 250 percent is more in the areas where it's really only one or two dwelling units per acre allowed currently and so they're much larger lots things are spread out more so if we really want to encourage affordable housing or allowance for people to have options even for people who need subsidized housing as opposed to people who can access it through the market we should be providing that opportunity in different neighborhoods throughout the city and not just allow it um, in downtown. Great, thank you for those, those examples. I just have two more minor questions. Um, if there are existing units on the property, would they be required to meet the fossil fuel free requirements? Um, under the affordable housing piece, is that what you're? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, the, uh, and, and it would probably um, go into, um, um, so it's for the entire project. Um, I think that that certainly would be a question about um, uh, whether or not you're taking an existing unit and having to convert that. Um, you know, going back to the 82 Bridge Street project, that was a complete gut renovation. So in that case, of course, you would do all the units. Um, I I'm trying to think, you know, I had a pic another picture on the slideshow of one of Valley's other projects at the end of um, um, Fort Hill Terrace in that neighborhood. And that was a full gut renovation too. I don't, I, you know, I'm trying to think of projects where you'd be, where a developer would be coming in and, and not doing a complete overhaul because the other piece is you have to meet the energy code. So 
there's going to be some, there would have to be some major upgrades anyway to any sort of existing structure. Um, so the way the language is written now, that's a long-winded way of, you said quick answer, I'm, I mean, quick question, but it does say project in totality. And so I guess I was just trying to play out what, what that might mean. But I, I, at this point, yes, it's for the whole project. Yeah, I was thinking, okay, say there's a single family house, but it's a big lot and the project would be, uh, would be to build a large building on the rest of the lot would the single family house have to be demolished or retrofitted? Um, so that's just, just a concern there. Um, and I would say in that case though, the project is the piece behind. Okay. Do you know what I'm saying? So Yeah, and then I noted um, that wood is explicitly mentioned. Um, you know, uh, certainly we could choose to disallow wood but I've never seen a definition of fossil fuels that included wood. So I uh, just wonder if that maybe should be worded a little bit differently. Okay. Thank you. Counselors, any other questions? Counselor Foster. So hard to get my hand in the screen there. <laughs> well, you're so little too. So <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn, a question I have for you that I, I didn't see in your presentation um, is about parking and where parking comes into this. So I'm just sort of like thinking through um, Counselor Jarrett's, you know, hypothetical situation of, of maybe if there's 15 units now on his lot, what, if any, requirements for parking would there be in there? I'm just trying to wrap my head around what that may end up looking like um, to neighborhoods. Yeah, I so um, the parking, unless an applicant were asking for a waiver from parking, um, parking would still be provided. The planning board has the authority to um, already right now for it doesn't have to be for affordable housing it could be for any type of housing could allow a reduction in parking um, many times um, on projects specifically for affordable housing um, and and uh, valley can speak to this their parking demand is much different from parking demands for um, market rate housing, but it also depends on the location. So again, if it's out on Woodlawn, people are gonna be required to have a car or a car share. I mean, they could share a car, so thereby reduce the amount of, of um, parking, but that can be a case by case determination. And there's nothing in either of these that talks about parking per se. In the half scale unit um, um, ordinance, uh, parking is based for residential uses on one space per thousand square feet of residential area. So for an 800 square foot unit, that's one parking space. That's the same. And, and then, so if you had two of them, that's two parking spaces required for um, two half scale units. That's the same number of parking spaces required for one single family home. So it's really a wash on for that ordinance. Okay, thank you. I was just trying to figure out where that would fall in if one of the goals is to reduce the number of car trips, if there may be. So anyway, that, that helped me understand. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Counselors, any other questions? Oh, Counselor Mayori, welcome to Community Resources. You're welcome to ask a question here. <laughs> Thank you for letting me interlope. Is that oh, a verb? Yeah, interloping is fine with community resources. <laughs> is that, a, is that a, even a verb? Uh, thank you. I know. I love that. Um, I just a quick question. You know, I um, well, I guess to um, I was wondering if there's a concrete definition of affordable units in the ordinance that's in quotes. Um, and then just like um, I guess I was wondering about examples in similar municipalities of this, these kind of specific changes being rolled out in this way, if they exist. Thank you. Um, so there is a definition of affordable housing in our zoning and it's been there for many, many years. And it requires that um, units be permanently deed restricted to meet the um, um, needs of people who are at 80% or below of the area 
median income. So they're making 80% or below area median income. The unit ha has, if it's an ownership unit, it has to be deed restricted for 30 years. If it's a rental building, um, you know, owned by a Valley CDC, let's say, um, then it has to be deed restricted for 99 years. Um, and then you had another part to that question. I forgot. Sorry. No, I was just wondering about uh, examples of other similar municipalities oh, right. and have kind of rolled it out in this way. Uh, um, we, in terms of the affordable housing piece, um, we don't know of anybody that sort of tackled the 40B problem. <laughs> um, most communities just rely on the state's regulations and just sort of push um, developers off to say, okay, go do your 40B thing. And when you get done with your, um, you got your site eligibility letter, then come talk to us. Um, and we did, we put out a, a query to see if anybody else had done this and we haven't found a community in Massachusetts that's done it. And of course, 40B is unique to Massachusetts. I mean, there are other states that have other programs, but this is particularly a Massachusetts thing. So, um, and in terms of the half scale, it's really modeled on the micro unit um, uh, uh, regulations that have been rolled out in cities across the country. Um, we're not calling them micro units because they're not really micro. I mean, when you're talking about micro units, it's more like 250, 300 square foot units. And typically that's what you see in big cities. Thank you. I'm glad that you were, were you know, looking to be leaders in this area. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you, counselors. Um, any other questions from counselors? Carolyn, I have uh, one quick question. Well, maybe it's not quick. Uh, how often do we expect that we would be seeing these types of developments with this new um, language in place? So are you talking about the affordable housing projects or? Yes. yes. Um, well, that might be a better question for Laura. I mean, so we work with Habitat, uh, Wayfinders, you know, Valley CDC, and actually, um, it kind of depends on what, uh, where projects, uh, project opportunities ha arise, and whether or not the zoning is consistent with the kind of um, units or the number of units that either one of those organizations is trying to build um, as to whether they need to go to currently go through a 40B process. And I don't want to speak for Laura, but I remember in my head um, comments coming from either Laura or Joanne about not ever, ever, ever wanting to do 40B. So please find a way for us not to do 40B. <laughs> um, so you know, we've tried to figure out other ways to do this. In fact, we did a 40, uh, another acronym from the state of 40R um, for Bridge Street because that was less onerous than the 40B process. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, they are, you're doing, I don't know, one or two, one project a year, every other year or something yeah. in Northampton. I kind of look at it as it might not, might or might not spur new development. It's favorable to us because it's just another path and another tool. And you look at each site and you say, well, how do we, you know, one might be good for 40R, one might be good for 40B, one might be by right. Um, but it's so, real estate is so kind of opportunistic um, that it, I don't think you'll have a rush of people given the requirement for affordability and no fossil fuels. And, you know, some of these are big ticket items that you're asking of a developer. I wouldn't anticipate you'd see a rush of people going to build these. Um, but again, for us, it's, it's site specific and it opens the door maybe potentially to some sites that are a little bit smaller that we might've walked away from. Thank you. So we, we're not going to see, if we approve this, we're not going to see affordable housing going up everywhere. That it's just- that I wish. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's other, there's other, you know, there's all kinds of um, built-in breaks on the system having to do a lot right. with financing. But 
you know, I think the tricky thing with zoning is, will you never see a project that people don't like? And the answer is that always, you know, there's always a risk, right? That some person builds something under a zoning ordinance that people don't like. But I don't see droves of people, um, nonprofit or private developers necessarily, that it would so change the dynamic of the, the number of production of units. Thank you. Counselors, are there any other questions here? All right, uh, then at this point, I'd like to see if there's members of the public who would like to ask about this particular uh, ordinance, the affordable housing ordinance. I see a Nick and Megan and Jackie. I, I have a question. I, I don't know how to raise my oh, hand. Oh, well, Chris, Chris Lee, who's here to speak about something else, you, you're free to ask as well. <laughs> <laughs> I do have it. So um, I have a question about, it's kind of a cross question for the affordable housing, this half, the half scale units. Did in the, and I think this applies mostly to the rural areas and how I'm thinking about it. Is there, so if, if you're doing half scale units, do you also get a 250% density bonus um, if you're doing half scale units? So if you can do four half scale units, can you jump that up to uh, 10 in, in a rural area? Well, the half scale unit um, ordinance is only applicable in urban oh, residential no. B and C. Right, okay. I was picturing little home villages out in the rural areas <laughs> and unlocking those areas, but okay. That's right. I grew up at Laurel Park. I was like, it's just like Laurel Park. <laughs> little <laughs> homes close together. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, committee members, should we, enter, uh, would somebody like to propose a positive recommendation for discussion? Um, and uh, could somebody make a motion to for a positive recommendation around this? Motion for a positive recommendation, Jim. Second. Okay, it's been motioned in and seconded. Uh, counselors, would you uh, discussion? Well, somebody's chair. <laughs> Go ahead, Councillor Jared. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm trusting that you know we'll, we'll we might, we'll probably hash out a lot more details uh, right. as this move moves forward, and I, I definitely still have some questions about it. But in general, you know, the promotion of affordable housing, uh, I want to encourage that. Um, you know, we're in just such a dire situation here and um, anything we can do. And I think that, that this, um, you know, is, is a great, is a great way to move forward with it. Um, so I, I'm happy to do a positive recommendation. Thank you. Any other discussion? I, you know, what I would like to add is having, I, I wanna thank Laura for being here to, to speak to, you know, how, you know, our, our zoning interacts with the actual folks out there doing the work in building the affordable housing and that, um, that, it, that I have a sense that this will be helpful, that um, also that we're not gonna see a deluge of affordable housing everywhere, which sometimes can freak out a lot of residents, that this is a tweaking of the process rather than a, than a, a dramatic change uh, it's something that'll be helpful, um, and um, and therefore I, I I support this idea. So, any other discussion? All right, let's do a roll call. Laura, for a positive recommendation. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. All right, cool. You know what? I, I had that deadline of trying to make that uh, or, uh, the, the downtown forum. I'm not sure we're going to get right in at six, but um, this is really a productive conversation we're having. So now on to um, our, or, our second ordinance before us, which has to do with creating half units. And um, 
uh, that uh, Catherine mentioned this earlier. And um, Chris, um, oh, could I, based on uh, what Carolyn shared, I know I'm putting you on the spot here. Um, how do you how do you think this was? Uh, this could be helpful to you. Of course, you could also pass some of this on to Tim O'Reilly here, who is also a part, partnering up with you, who's a, uh, our, your local rep, I understand. And, yeah, Tim, you've got it. It's all you. Yeah, Tim, go. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that uh, Chris, if you could speak to how this new zoning would be helpful for you meeting your ends. And, and just for one uh, additional piece of introduction here, Chris is the is the person who developed the 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 ADU that has gone in up in Florence, up at uh, Aiden O'Donohue's. It, it's now Aiden O'Donohue's home, and um, he'll be moving it in into it at some point in the future, and um, and maybe at some point he'll even show up and give us a, a tour sometime. Um, I actually got a tour out there yesterday. Aiden gave me a tour. It was, he, he's really in love with this place. So anyway, um, so Chris, any thoughts that how this is helpful for you? Sure. Well, thanks for mentioning the floor, the the house behind Valley's house, Aiden's house. Um, that that actually is not a half scale unit. That one's huge. <laughs> Well, I understand it's 850 square feet, right? 850, so it, it fits into it, the... Uh, so it's 50 feet away from counting as one of our smaller units. Right, right. Okay. So it's close. Um, and, and it's, so Northampton, I'll, I'll just say, of all of the towns that we have spoken with and, and, and talked to, has the most creative planning department, I think, in all of Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's amazing how... It, it, it's just amazing how many different ways that are trying to be pushed forward to spur different types of housing. Um, and in terms of specifically with half scales and, and what we've been doing, um, I mean, the, the small houses that we're building, we're building because especially elderly residents are looking for them. Um, they just need a smaller space and they want it to be not in an apartment building. Um, there's not a lot of that around. We haven't built a lot of small units, I think, since like the 60s, 70s era um, with the old ranches. Um, but in terms of the zoning, there, right now there's a lot. I think there's three paths to build small detached units in backyards. Um, the way we did it in, um, in Florence for Val Aiden's house, which was just getting it approved as a second unit which worked well and didn't have any size restrictions. And it also allowed us not to have to um, file any occupancy requirements with the registry of deeds. Um, I think that two family throughout the city is going to be another way that would allow us to do this. Um, and then the half scale units would be a third way. So I actually, um, I've been, as I was reading through these, I've been trying to wrap my head around the differences between the three and how we would use them separately um, on the regions. And I'm, I'm actually not entirely sure yet. Um, so I wanted to ask that question of, of how they would be different and how we should be looking at them differently. Uh, in terms of uh, comments, ideas. So one thing that we did run into um, and we're gonna continue to run into in, in Northampton, Florence, Leeds, with doing these kinds of projects where we're essentially creating a standalone unit in someone's backyard is a requirement to have one electric service per lot. And I say it, it sounds like a, a, a relatively small issue, um, but it's something that could cost a homeowner an extra $5,000 to build one of these. So a relatively large part of these budgets, just from um, often if we're built, especially if we're I mean, we only build with electric anyway. We're not bringing fossil fuels into our houses. Um, but often upgrading an electric service, if you have to go from a 200 amp to a 400 amp, it goes to a commercial realm and it's a very, very expensive upgrade. Um, and we could avoid that if we could just run a second wire from the street um, and let the power company deal with it. But one kind of a side to this, um, 
And then the other question that this is at one of the things that we've been trying to unleash is the opportunities for ownership opportunities would be small homes um, because an ownership opportunity is almost always going to be less expensive than a rental opportunity because you don't have to have profit built into the ownership opportunity with a mortgage. You don't have to, someone's not pricing in their time to worry about it. Um, and with these half scale units, especially with if there's a house that's already 800 square feet or less and has a large backyard, it would be fantastic to figure out how to work in um, some kind of flag lot situation where we could avoid doing conduization and create a clean subdivision, um, which would give owners of these small homes the ability to maintain control of the development and not necessarily have to hand it off to a bigger entity or, uh, or, or and start including any level of speculation. <clears throat> Um, but I guess with that, I, I, I did want to, I guess, go some of the question to Carolyn is the difference between these three and why, like, why would we choose one way or the other? Um, sure. Oh, so I think, um, you know, in terms of the, the, it depends on the district, right? So if you're going to be building in, you just did a 600 plus square foot one in Leeds, yep. in a district in which currently only a single family house um, or single family with accessory would be allowed. Now a two family is allowed uh, potentially if city council adopts that ordinance, that would mean two family um, units would be allowed in Leeds. So therefore that unit would that you're designing would not be restricted to ownership um, requirements uh, and could be sold off as a separate um, you know, a unit, um, uh, and it would be considered a two family, uh, essentially, uh, a second unit on a parcel. Um, in turn, and so that's what you would continue to sort of look for in those districts, um, URA, SRRR. In urban residential B and C, um, you know, you might uh, be able to create more units if you're doing sort of a cluster or a cottage kind of development that, you know, one of the things coming off of the heels of the 2010 Sustainable Northampton Plan was a specific recommendation to allow or to encourage more cottage type developments where we've had multiple detached structures on a parcel. Um, but, the you still need to calculate the units per lot size and that gives you your total number of units you're allowed with the half scale um, the calculus would be different so if your individual cottage units on a parcel were all 800 square feet or less then you could potentially do twice as many as you would otherwise because once you start doing three or four units on a parcel your lot size goes up by 2500 square feet for each unit if it were just a standalone uh, you know unrestricted size mm -hmm. um so that is um would be so let's say you wanted to do six um 700 square foot units on a parcel um you would only need 7,500 square feet of lot size for those six units. Instead of right now for six units, you need um, 15,000 square feet of lot size. Right, so, right, and if, yeah, because you, you know one property we've been looking at that we may try to do a community on and uh -huh in that one in particular we couldn't we, we it, it's allowed more units than we could do with a um, cottage community you end uh -huh. up needing to stack them or, or do duplexes which isn't which isn't bad either um yeah. it, it actually that it, it pushed it, it's pushing us to do something where we can get a little bit more density um to make them fit because the more you the more you get on there as long as they're still comfortable the less expensive that they can be which is yeah. which is always great right 
Well, I mean, and, and the Leeds project as well, the, the two family throughout the city, I think is, is, is probably one of the most advantageous things, especially for what we're doing, um, especially when we're looking at uh, trying to diversify housing in the rural areas, which I think is uh, one of the things that the small houses can do really good at, just with the ability to find places to put them and create two private areas on a bigger lot. Um, it, it's fantastic. And I, I think that we'll continue to do a lot of that. Um, and it would have been better for the project in Leeds as well, just because it would have been simpler and there wouldn't be the registry of deeds and there wouldn't be an ownership requirement and we wouldn't have had to have a hearing, <laughs> which I don't know that I'll be surprised if we ever have a hearing in Northampton, like we've had in Amherst or other towns. <laughs> so it's again, nice operating. Good night. <laughs> well, 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 I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I hope not. I we've, yeah, the, the boards seem much much nicer and and realize the difference between uh, an accessory dwelling unit or a small house and a eighteen unit apartment building. So at this point, I'd like to open it up to. Um, I see your question. Oh, sorry. go ahead, Carolyn. Carolyn, you have the floor. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. I. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to Chris's um, oh, comment about the electrical connections. I don't, you know, that's not something that zoning can address. And I don't know, I don't know enough about the building code if that, if it's um, the Northampton interpretation of the building code or if it's national grids requirement. So I just wanted to make sure, I mean, it's not something that we have any control over in this purview as it relates to the zoning ordinance. Oh, interesting. It was something that Wayne Fiden had said to me uh, a long time ago when we first started doing this. And it stuck with me as being uh, kind of odd because when, when we did our first one in East Hampton, uh, the situation allowed us to, it, to do two separate services, which was significantly cheaper than trying to do the, uh, the single service. And it was up to Eversource, not up to the town, which is what I thought. Um, and it was... Uh, I, I don't know if I've followed up on that with, I think, I think someone in building may have said that as well. Um, but it just struck me as a, maybe it was a zoning or planning thing because didn't want additional wires going to the property from an aesthetic standpoint, but given that there's no design requirements, that was also odd. So I wasn't sure where it was coming from, but it does have big cost implications, especially if we go out into rural areas and. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think the boards could require potentially that there not be any overhead lines and, you know, additional lines coming from the street as if it were part of a site plan or special permit. But um, it um, that's not and the boards have required that in some situations, but as a standalone sort of element in the zoning, I don't there's there are a couple places where we address that from an aesthetic standpoint but not as it relates in particular to a detached unit as far as i know so we guess we'll have to follow up with building because some interesting things came up with um uh plumbing code interpretation on the most recent project mm -hmm. um because the two houses are like the question of where the interior of the house is stopped was was raised <laughs> But anyway, not, not for this meeting. I think that's a building <laughs> interpretation question. The, the nitty gritty. Chris, it's really helpful to have you here. I want to thank, thank you for being here. I also at this point want to open it up to counselors with some questions for either Chris or Carolyn within that dialogue that they've had. Counselor Maori, the interloper. <laughs> You're yep, muted. Uh, there you go. Uh, this might be a question for either of you. You know, I'm just, when you're talking about Leeds, I live in Leeds and I have well and septic, my private well and septic. And I guess I'm having a hard time picturing the infrastructure piece. And, uh, you know, I don't know if we're gonna have more latitude around uh, septic and well requirements if you're adding units um, 
or anything like that? It's all based on the co the you know the health code. Um, so if your septic is you know sized to accommodate another bedroom or two bedrooms or what have you, you know it's going to be whatever Title Five requirements would be. Right, because that might be a, a barrier um, because it's so expensive to kind of re replace. Yeah, that septic it could be. Well. Yeah. Okay, it is a, it is a barrier. It's very expensive to do that, but on the other side of it, it's still more expensive to to put someone in a nursing home or a uh, any other kind of retirement facility. So it's it's kind of true, and and it is and it is tough too, especially. And we've we've had the luxury of being able to see this Title Five and septic from multiple states now. Um, and it's definitely harder in mass to go through the steps to figure out whether or not your septic can add capacity. There's a lot of hoops. And unfortunately, there's a lot of expense with those hoops from hiring outside engineers and having town oversight when the engineers are doing their work. It's, it's definitely tough. But the, um, at least what we've seen, we haven't worked with a health agent in Northampton yet, but we have elsewhere. And uh, the health agents are usually very reasonable in how they interpret um, whether or not the septic system can sustain additional flow and then how they're looking at bedroom counts. And if um, we've, we've often seen health agents allow conversions of bedrooms uh, for work from home capacity and then having some degree of is the number of people living here actually going up uh, given I don't know uh, if they should be doing that because they're supposed to be looking at 30 year decisions. Um, but we haven't had a bad experience on that yet. Um, we've been, we've been lucky. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I, Carolyn, I have a question um, that, that the half scale units, this applies just to URA and URB, is that correct? URB and URC. URB and URA, right. Um, and, um, and why not URA? Um, because there aren't currently, um, the idea was to um, address, uh, really it's, a, it's an issue about Typically, it's been an issue about multifamily housing um, and where more than just single family homes are allowed. So in URA, now we'll be allowing two families, but that's going to be it. So there's no, you can't do a four family on a lot in URA or RRSR. Um, but, you know, we've been thinking about this concept of how to um, sort of balance and use a different uh, mechanism for calculating the total number of units allowed on a property for many years. Um, and, um, you know, given that it's all, always been, well, for at least the last 25 years, we got rid of FAR a long time ago, but for the last 20 years, um, we've had the number of units allowed is based on your lot size. And so there was always an incentive. So if I can do five units, I'm going to do, I'm going to maximize the size of those units to the greatest extent possible because I know I can't do six. So I'm going to get as much as I can out of the five. And even though we've been asking over the years for developers to think about smaller units. So if they're going to do, uh, you know, instead of doing um, a six family, that's all, you know, 1500 square foot units, could you do six? mixed size or smaller and there's just no um there's much more return for a bigger unit and so we're trying to sort of balance that and say okay if we really want smaller units we've got to figure out a way that it works um you know for the on the performa side to get those in okay uh thank you um it, personally, I, I'm interested in seeing the equity of it being, um, you know, shared with URA, and and I actually think that um, that the the uh, residents who live in URA are would be much more open to 
uh, all of these uh, new uh, measures to you know allow for additional units. I know when we went through the this, the rezoning and the lead up to you know finally pushing things through in 2012, that um, that there may have been uh, some pushback, but that I, I think that um, that uh, per other discussions related to that thing I can't mention <laughs> that we haven't, you know, I, I, we haven't heard pushback around that and that I don't anticipate that there would be pushback around this. And I, I'm, I think it would be interesting to also include URA in this process um, that um, I'm not gonna recommend that we make that amendment here, but, um, but would like to bring it to council to discuss that. Um, well, I think, you know, one of the things that we've talked about since 2012 is really where do these district boundaries make sense? And so we went through the planning board several iterations of looking at the entire zoning map and thinking about what areas of URA really are like URB and really should be rezoned URB. So it's about a map change to say, not necessarily expand where certain elements of or uses are allowed, but maybe I, th I think that there are large pockets of URA that really are the wrong zone for where they are. Mm -hmm. And so I think that might be, uh, that's a sort of a different way of coming to the same thing that you're getting to, I think, um, Councillor, is by sort of just looking, saying, where does it make sense to allow more than just two families? And those, all those areas should be URB or URC. Well, I, I, I appreciate that you and planning department are considering this. That's, that's great. Um, is there any discussion? I, I think I'm still on topic of, of eliminating URA entirely that, and then, you know, and then we wouldn't have this distinction. Uh, we did talk about that, but sort of looking at, I think they, um, w looking at the map, I think the areas of URA shrunk down quite a bit. Um, I think it probably makes sense to reconsider after if the two family by right gets adopted. But for example, there was no, um, you know, Leeds is sort of, was probably the only place where we are looking at maybe keeping URA and most other places it made sense to rezone to URB or C depending on where it was. For There's some pockets of A uh, around Crescent Street, Round Hill Road that are completely surrounded by URC and URB and it just doesn't make sense. There's an, also another pocket off of Ward Avenue. Um, so, um, but then there's some areas around Florence um, Center that are also A, um, and then there's Leeds. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And um, and and Chris raised this idea of uh, tiny subdivisions that um, that and also the 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 question of ownership that. Um, that so let's say somebody puts uh, two half units on their property and now they have they have three units they have a, a main house and then two uh, smaller units um, but they're still part of the same property correct where somebody could sell off that unit but it, it actually acts more like a condo rather than it's not like somebody could take their half unit, you know, we and carve that out. Right. But it becomes an, uh, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Yeah, um, I, and, right. And what we about haven't tiny talked subdivision? We haven't with, talked about um, reducing lot size, frontage, um, you know, um, width. Right. Uh, so that's that would be part of that conversation. Um, we, you know, the only, there are three zoning districts in the city where there is no minimum lot size and no minimum frontage. 
um, at Central Business, General Business, and the Plan Village District. Actually, I think also entrance business, but that's about to get absorbed into central business. Um, so, uh, you know, those are the commercial areas where we don't have minimum frontage or lot size requirements. And that's the kind of thing that um, would uh, be required um, to do, uh, to sort of create separate parcels for um, properties, um, multiple properties. And then of course you get into, you still have a shared, you still need an association for access and parking because everything would be shared anyway. Um, and so it just has bigger ramifications than just saying, um, let's create separate individual lots for these cottage clusters. I get it. All right, thank you. Um, any other questions from counselors? Any questions from members of the public here? I see Nick, Marty, Megan, Jackie. I don't see any hands raised. I don't see anybody raising their hands on the screen. Okay, so um, is there, could I get a motion to send a recommendation, positive, neutral, or otherwise? Um, anybody wanna make a motion here? Move a Move. positive recommendation. Second. Okay, so motion made by Councillor Foster, seconded by Councillor Jarrett. Any discussion? Councillor Jarrett. Thank you. So yeah, I just wanted to say a few notes about you know my reason for a positive recommendation. I, I think we need to adjust to the needs uh, of the population and families are smaller now. We need to think about the needs of older people, the needs of people whose children can't afford to live here, um, but could, you know, adding adding small units could allow for that. Um, all of these mean that we need a maximum of flexibility, I think, especially in areas where walking and biking and public transit are accessible, and that's URB and C is the primary place uh, for that. <laughs> Um, and uh, just also a note about the heating systems. I think in this case, there's no question, you know, in talking with the people in the industry for a small unit like this, it's actually less expensive to use a ductless mini split uh, heat pump than to use uh, other sources. So uh, it's, it's very clear, I think, that, that this, this, uh, this, this applies uh, for these small units. And I'm happy to make a positive recommendation. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody else? Hey, Councillor Nash. Yes, Councillor Thorpe. Not, not a question, just so people know out there that we're making a positive recommendation, but this is going before legislative matters before this goes before the council, correct? Correct. And, no. in, and at legislative matters, it will be a public hearing where uh, the public will be invited as well as council to uh, participate, to hear what the proposal is and add their um, uh, feedback. Yes. And it is the time to do it. Once it gets to council, it's, it's not a time for people to expect to be uh, interacting. So meetings like this and that public hearing are the time to show up. Okay. Uh, hearing no more discussion, um, uh, Laura, could we get a roll call for a positive recommendation to City Council? Councillor Foster? Yes. Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. And Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Okay. So, um, I, I, um, so we have two items on our agenda that were discussion items. And I would like to push those off until our next meeting uh, because I think that uh, folks would really like to get over to the Picture Main Street Forum. I really wanna thank both Chris and uh, Tim and also Laura Baker for showing up today. That was super helpful to have that discussion to interact with uh, Carolyn. And um, so, with that, that would bring us to 
our motion to adjourn. I will, oh, new business, any new business? Good, no new business. <laughs> Not tonight, Councillor Nash. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so- I have uh, a question. Yeah. Can I have it? Well, actually, it's not a question. It's a comment. I don't know if you, um, you know, wanted to address it or not. But I know Jackie Balance had mentioned that um, she wanted a checklist for site plan now um, to address single family homes and the single family homes being built in Bay State. And I just wanted to clarify that single family homes don't get site plan review anyway. So even if and when we do sort of um, start to bring in elements of that climate resilience and regeneration plan, um, site plan would not ever um, apply to the construction of a single family home. Thank you for clarifying that, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. Councilor Jarrett. Um, so it, just to clar clarify on that, that the the way, to, the only way to change that would be some sort of state level advocacy, state level change. Um, I suppose so. I mean, I will say that there are some site plans that are related to construction of single family homes, but not for the approval of the single family house itself. And yes, single family homes are basically protected um, under state state statute. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This is me being pushy. <laughs> so, hey, can I get a motion to adjourn? <laughs> motion to adjourn. adjourn. Okay. So motion made by Councillor Thorpe and seconded by uh, Councillor Jarrett. Um, Laura, could we get a uh, no discussion on this? Laura, could we get a roll call? Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay. All right. We are adjourned.